Welcome to Cup of Joe. For those of you that are return uh, attendees, thank you for returning. For those of you that are, this is their first time, welcome. My name is Mike Carrazzo. I'm the content manager here at Ryerson. Cup of Joe, we like to call it a um, coffee talk with a shot of commodities expertise. Of course, that expertise is not mine. It is the person to my right, it looks like on the panel, Nick Webb. Nick, how are you doing? Today? Good afternoon. I'm doing great. How are you? Doing well. Doing well, and you'll see the panel is a little loaded here at the top. We have two special guests. We have Mike Nauman and Jeffrey Pitsenberger, both general managers for Ryerson Advanced Processing. Thank you guys for joining us. Glad yeah. to be here. Should be fun. So um, as we uh, alluded to last month, we did a, uh, did a poll here about additional topics that we wanna cover. Um, fabrication was one that um, came across that we wanna learn a little bit more about. So Mike and Jeff um, will be joining the uh, joining the discussion as Nick navigates through the uh, through the slide deck. And Nick, before I turn it over to you, just want to remind everybody in the audience here, you have the chat button at the bottom, the Q and A. I apologize, the Q and A button at the bottom. Fill in a question, and we will try to get to it as we go. If not, we'll try to get to those at the end. Um, Nick and Mike and Jeff will be happy to answer your questions. And of course, a full recording of this will be available tomorrow on YouTube as well. So without further ado, Nick, hand it over awesome. to you. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and, and for those who, who have watched prior sessions of Cup of Joe, we're going to have it structured a slightly bit different this time. Um, what we're going to do is within the macro coverage, I'm actually going to touch on aluminum and stainless within, within that section. Then I'm going to kick it over to our Ryerson Advanced Processing team, uh, Mike and Jeff. And then, and then we'll bring it back to myself to finish up on the carbon side of things. And you'll see why, why I structured it that way. There's, there's a lot to talk about this month. And it's a little, if, if it wasn't structured this way, it was going to come off a little disjointed. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we have a lot to uh, share. I'll go ahead and share my screen right now. So first things first. The safe harbor provision. These are the opinions of Nick Webb, Mike Nauman, Jeff Pitsenberger. Um, they are not the opinions of Ryerson. Do your own research um, and uh, don't hold us hostage if, if Mike or Jeff say anything too, too funny business oriented. Um, let's go ahead and hop into things. First things first on the Federal Reserve side of things. Uh, it does look as though the Federal Reserve has finally gotten the, the hint that inflation is out there, inflation is real. They announced just yesterday afternoon that they're going to begin tapering the asset purchases. So for, for the last you know, 12 months, basically, the Federal Reserve has been buying about $120 billion worth of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. They are going to begin in the month of November, so within the next couple of weeks, tapering that off by $15 billion per month. So the current trajectory, the current expectation is that by June of 2022, some of the accommodation from the Federal, Federal Reserve will be coming out of the system. So, um, you know, call it maybe a little bit of a headwind within the macro environment or said a different way, just less accommodation from the Federal Reserve. Secondly, uh, we have a partial removal and evolution of the Section 232 tariffs. Uh, many of you have probably seen these headlines, but, and, and I, I took a couple uh, snippets from the actual commerce um, document. It's, it's actually 70 pages. So there is far, far more detail than what's shown here within this, uh, these two snippets right here. But from a high level, essentially what's happening is they're putting in place what's called a tariff rate quota, TRQ. And what that's going to do is up to some threshold. In the case of steel, it's 3.3 million tons. In the case of aluminum, depending on whether it's wrought or unwrought aluminum, there are going to be thresholds there as well, which you can see down in the bottom paragraph. Essentially, there will be a removal of tariffs up to those volumes of imports. Above those thresholds, the same tariffs will apply against these European nations. Um, you know, my, my quick take, and maybe we can talk about this more at the end, my quick take is that the aluminum side really isn't all that material. We've seen a small bit of price movement within Midwest premiums. We've obviously seen a little bit of price movement in aluminum over the last couple of weeks, but I don't think it was really surrounding this announcement. And, and with regards to the tariff rate quote on aluminum, the volume threshold is so small that it, I believe it represents right around half a percent 
of US consumption. So it's not a real material number. In the case of steel, I think it's a little more meaningful, but in all honesty, even on the future side of things, you'll see it here later in the presentation. Um, I think a lot of this was already built in and expected within the market. And, and, th and that's why I think in the last couple of days, we really haven't seen all that much movement to the downside. But you know, a removal of a 25% tariff on, on European product on a couple million tons, that, that could at least drop the floor ever so slightly within the carbon world. Um, but again, we'll talk about that here at the end of the presentation. Hey, Nick, uh, quick clarification on that. So does that mean 25% is taken off of these European nations, but are, is Section 232 still in place elsewhere for other, other countries? Absolutely. Section 232 is very much so still in play. Um, it's worth noting that the common alloy uh, or taxes um, on aluminum are also still in play. So, so yeah, th this, is, this is only a minor revision, really, with regards to the global landscape. Do we think it opens up import at all from the conversation we were talking about with Jeff last month? Well, I think, uh, I think with regards to aluminum or, or aluminum and steel, really, I think, I think we really already were seeing ramp ups in import volumes. Um, this just changes the price at which they come in. So, so from mm -hmm. a volumetric standpoint, I don't think it changes a whole lot. I think um, obviously the arbitrage or the gap between the price of aluminum or, or sorry, of European material coming in that gap widens out a little bit, which allows domestic prices to come down a little. Um, but in terms of volume, no, I don't think it has too much of an impact because in some situations, Europe's having, Europe's got a very tight market right now as well. So, um, you know, un until something changes, I, I think that remains to be the case. Makes sense. So hopping into the PMIs, uh, we touch on this pretty much monthly. It remains to be the case that we're seeing a little bit of a rollover in the pace of growth for the US and for the European region. Um, still very much so growth, hovering right around 58. In the case of China, I think it continues to be the case that we're seeing some, some weakness coming out of that, that landscape. Um, for the last couple of months, we have seen China hovering right around 50, basically right kind of at flat growth. They have moved into negative territory. Um, we may touch on this more at the end of the presentation, but I think Kind of under the, under the radar, under the surface, I do think there's there's some pretty interesting things going on within China. Some of it bullish, some of it bearish. On the bearish side, which I think may be contributing here, their property sector and their property industry continues to suffer a bit. I think a little bit of that is purposeful, where the government has been trying to take a lot of credit and things like that out of the system to remove risk taking, and uh, and it and it does look like it's feeding through to some difficult. Um, basically difficulties with regards to the property sector paying back its, its loans or its debt, so making those coupon payments. Um, so uh, a little bit of squishiness there. We're yet, yet to really see a whole lot of that spill into global commodity prices just yet. And I think that's really just because Europe and the United States have kind of taken, taken the reins for the most part. Now, we talked last month, we had several slides about the kind of global energy issues. And if we looked at these charts a month ago, they were all going straight parabolic up. Well, fast forward one month, life comes at you fast. A lot has changed. Um, this is a chart of the Chinese thermal coal market. So there are two types of coal. There's metallurgical coal, and then there's thermal coal. Thermal coal is basically what's being utilized to power electricity production. So the prices of electricity were going up at a very, very rapid rate. And we talked about this last month that it was causing issues really in, in a number of different industrial sectors. It was causing Apple to be forced to ration power and shut down some of its operations. Tesla and some of their suppliers were having to shut down some of their operations. Magnesium producers were being forced to shut down some of their, uh, you know, their production. Fast forward one month, what's happened? Well, China basically two, three weeks ago came out and said, we need to put a cap on coal prices. We need to put a cap on electricity prices. And oh, by the way, um, while everybody else in the world is going to be at a climate summit, we are going to ask our coal miners to produce as much coal as they can. So I uh, just saw the headline this morning, China in the month of October produced the most coal, record coal amount that they've ever produced in the history of their economy. So, so much for being green, so much for those clear skies for the Olympics for now. Um, and, and we have seen a price reaction. And the reason why, why I'm talking about energy here is because I think it has tangential 
maybe not even that tangential, but it has, has impacts on metals markets across the globe and, and maybe even more than just metals. This is similarly, we looked at this chart last month, price of natural gas within, within uh, the United Kingdom. The reason why I want to touch on this, one, it's got a similar looking chart where it was going parabolic up. It has retraced a little bit. It's still very much so at elevated levels. So I don't think we're fully through this risk of an energy, energy crisis as we head into winter. But for now, it's retreated a little bit. Um, but specifically with regards to European natural gas, it is worth noting that on the 8th of November, it's expected right now that Russia is supposed to open up some of their gas flows into the European region. There are a lot of question marks about whether or not that's gonna happen because obviously Russia needs their own gas supplies to heat their homes and things like that. Uh, so I think a lot of traders, a lot of analysts are watching whether or not that actually does come to fruition. Um, but we talked about it last month and we kind of put on our conspiracy theory hats where it did kind of look, and it still kind of looks like Russia is sort of holding hostage to the European energy markets. So this is a global phenomenon. I would say it's, it's happening less within the United States. We're obviously seeing elevated energy prices, um, but, but not to the extent where the, the charts don't look quite like they do within Europe and, uh, and Asia. But with that, with that said, I wanna remind everybody again, kind of how this chart looks, which again, this is the thermal coal market for China, which is driving power prices. The reason why I bring that up is because you start looking at things like LME aluminum. Ever since the, the uh, power prices peaked out three weeks ago, we've seen the price of aluminum come off to the tune of about 25 cents, which, which is about 20, 20 to 22% uh, in a very quick fashion. So I do think that a lot of traders were, were pretty spooked about what was happening on the energy side of things. Um, with regards to aluminum production, it could have meant that smelters would have to pay a way higher price or, or God forbid, may not be able to get power to produce aluminum and the price of aluminum shot up. Well, it cuts both ways and we're seeing that cutting the other direction right now. Now, what I will say here is, is going to be true of not just energy markets, but I think it's also going to be true of metals markets, which is I'm not a weatherman, but if in the event we head into a very cold winter, I don't think all of these risks are completely off the table with regards to energy prices ripping back higher. I could be wrong. Um, if we have a warmer than normal winter, may maybe we've got enough supplies, but, but whether we're looking at gas, oil, coal, uh, markets are pretty darn tight. And, uh, and I know we talked about this in, in last month's Cup of Joe, but some of that's purposeful. Some of that is in an effort to move more and more towards a green economy. But I think, uh, I think some of those intermittent energy sources like, like wind, like solar, uh, there were situations where Europe just didn't have wind for a couple of weeks and they had to rely on some other source. And while we're seeing what happens when those, when those inventories of those, those traditional sources aren't quite what they used to be. So with that being said, let's move through some of these charts as we talk through not just aluminum, but zinc. This is, this is going to relate to um, mostly coating extras with regards to carbon markets. It is worth noting that some of the domestic mills have implemented their own coating extras on carbon steel. So as it relates to galvanized product, but again, it's cut higher. It's also cutting lower as, as energy prices are coming back down. So I think we're going to see immense volatility as we roll into these winter months coming ahead. This has gotten a lot of headlines over the last, I'd say two months. And we are certainly seeing the announcements of surcharge implementation on magnesium. I think they're going one step further. I think there were even concerns and maybe even still are some concerns about whether or not smelters were even going to, or aluminum producers were going to be able to obtain magnesium. Because as, we, as, we've, as we've discussed in the past, uh, China produces about 90% of the world's magnesium. And if, if they're having to ration power, well, where are you going to get that magnesium? There, is, there isn't really a place. So there, there is and, and was and maybe still could be a real risk that if energy prices start cutting back higher, which they could, um, this risk may not be completely off the table yet. But as mentioned, the, the way it's being mitigated thus far is with surcharges. On, on common alloy aluminum, specifically with regards to five series aluminum. So Nick, I'll hold you up on that one for a second. So if you look at those, what just for 
for clarity, right? The energy crisis is helping, or is actually not helping, but forcing these commodities, magnesium, zinc, to move higher, which then um, increases the the production. And then, in the case of magnesium, since it's so for the um, the five, as you said, the five thousand series. Yep. Um, then it makes availability of those grades lesser. That's right. And and in, you know, in speaking with some of the aluminum mills, it's it varies from mill to mill. Some of them aren't concerned at all about sourcing the magnesium right now. Some of them are scared to quote product into 2022. So there's a there's a very wide range, and it depends. It's kind of like the automotive industry, where depending on what their contract for semiconductors looked like, some automotive companies are in better spots. That's kind of what's happening within the magnesium landscape as it relates to aluminum. Some mills feel like they're in a pretty good spot, and they, maybe they're relying on scrap sources or things like that. The ones who are relying on kind of virgin, perhaps Chinese-based uh, raw magnesium, they're they're a little more concerned about this. Um, so it's got real global ramifications. Hey Nick, quick question. So what is there? A, what's the timing lag between uh, you're talking about coal in China, uh, natural gas in the UK? Is what's is there, what's that lag for that period where it impacts our commodities? Yeah, I would say it's fairly instantaneous. I mean, these markets are all pretty heavily traded. And I would say right now, the global energy issues are very much so on the radar of commodity traders. So it very much so looks like if coal prices go up, that same day, we likely see LME aluminum prices go up as well. So, so they are taking cues from one another, it does seem. And then, and then less so, you know, obviously this chart doesn't look quite like the ones prior, but I, I did want to note that, uh, that we did see year-to-date high prices on nickel as well. If you ran the same chart on copper, it'd be the same thing. All of these base metals markets essentially peaked out right around that same time where electricity prices were peaking out in China. So I, th I think it's relevant. I personally find it very fascinating and interesting because it is a little bit of a chaos theory type mechanism where you know, butterfly, butterfly flaps its wings in China and all of a sudden base metals markets globally uh, follow suit. So it's a pretty interesting thing to watch. But I, but it, you know, I think the takeaway from all of this is keep your eyes and ears very close to the energy story because as this evolves, if we head into very cold temperatures or colder than expected temperatures this winter, um, stockpiles of fossil fuels are, are pretty lean. And again, I think some of that's purposeful. But with that being said, it could drive the price of a lot of these things rapidly higher if, if we get into that situation. Now, that's just kind of a, a warning. It's not necessarily my base case, um, but I think it probably has odds of 20 or 30% to, to play out that way. And if, if we see power prices rip back higher, I, I very much so think that the base metals could follow suit. And with all that said, again, kind of just re reiterating the point, whether it's magnesium, silicon, uh, natural gas or zinc, suppliers of metal are figuring out ways to implement these cost increases into the price of, of, uh, of their metal. So for instance, magnesium, we're obviously seeing a surcharge from some of the domestic mills. Uh, we're hearing that range somewhere around 11 cents a pound. Silicon is starting to feed its way into uh, stainless steel surcharges. Silicon is also an ingredient going into to carbon steel. So I think that's one to watch. Uh, natural gas, we're not quite yet in the territory where it's, it's playing a role in stainless steel surcharges. Because the chart's a little small, I apologize. We're currently sitting at 558. Um, anytime a monthly price averages above $6 per MMBTU, that would be when we would see uh, a surcharge for natural gas kick in. And then lastly, I mentioned this already, but the price of zinc, given its massive run up in the last couple of weeks and, and, and thus further retracement, we have seen some uh, some carbon mills implement coating extras, so or, or or adding to the coating extras rather. Nick had still had, had stainless providers not um, or mills not previously um, factored silicon into the sur surcharge. Is that something? It, it was always part of the equation, but it's actually based on a pricing trigger, and it's different for the supply mill. So so Autocompu has a different trigger than North American Stainless does. If I'm remembering off the top of my head, I want to say it's a buck fifty per pound for Autocompu. I believe it's two dollars or two fifty for North American Stainless. And essentially, it's the the mechanism is always there. It just doesn't trigger on until or unless silicon prices breach a certain level. And for Autocompu right now, we have breached that that level. So it is it is an active 
component. And, and we do have a follow up question from the audience. I think it's it's appropriate here. Is there a tipping point for producing mills to implement or remove a surcharge? Uh, I mean, I, th I think, <laughs> yeah, sure. I, th I think it's kind of like wages. When when they when they tend to hike prices, they tend to be way slower to take things back down. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it would probably have to be negotiated or there would have to be a substantial change in the supply demand fundamentals of whatever market that would be in order for them to come back and say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll drop coding extras or we'll drop the silicon surcharge. Um, I guess in the case of silicon, it's more formulaic. It's just, it's just based on math. In the case of zinc coding extras, that's one that's kind of a little more finger in the air. They, they decide on a random day that they, they want to hike coding extras. Those can go the opposite way too, but they tend to happen slower. With that being said, we are blessed with Jeff Kitzenberger and Mike Nauman. Um, I am going to take it straight over them because they're going to do what they do or, or describe what they do with far more justice than I ever could. So without further ado, go ahead, gentlemen. Hey, hey, Jeff, I'll kick, I'll kick it off. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Anytime I can talk about value added, that's a great thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, I thought I'd start, Mike Carrazzo will get ner a little nervous here, but I thought I'd start with a, a little story relative to uh, a customer that I just got back literally today from visiting. And I think it's kind of the overarching um, challenge for as we move into 2022. And that is what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of, whether it's an OEM, contract manufacturer, fabrication facilities, uh, there are a lot of customers that are pretty bullish on 2022. And if you go back to some of the previous Cup of Joes in the chat, specifically one from last week, there's a lot of variables right now that are still playing into um, the market. And uh, I, th I think it's very fascinating. This particular customer, very bullish. And um, it's a matter of how do we, as a, uh, as a distributor fabricator, help them achieve their goals? So I thought I'd kick it off with that. Uh, and Nick, it's interesting because, you know, we still have labor issues, right? We, we have, in some cases, constraint of raw material issues. And there's a lot of bullish customers out there, which, I've, which I'm happy about. But it's going to be an interesting dynamic as we move into 2022. I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And in some cases, I think, I think those issues are getting worse. I guess uh, a quick question for you would be, you know, as, as we see some of these things happening within, we talk a lot about the Asian markets and, and the European markets. If, if customers of ours are, um, are, are trying to import, you know, fabricated products, but it's perhaps getting much more difficult to do so or much more expensive to do so, um, how, how do you and your team kind of play a role in, in helping customers perhaps change up that supply chain or, or figure out a solution for, for something like that? Hey, I'll kick it over to my partner, Jeff Pitsenberg, because it's what we do. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, there's two pieces to this answer. One, uh, you, you can't necessarily see that far ahead and something's just happened to you. So you got to make the best of the situation that you're dealt. However, <clears throat> you know, the flexibility in that supply chain is, is something that we've considered very heavily throughout, uh, throughout this year. So we've got some bullets here, but we, we've generally responded with solutions. You know, these aren't problems. Um, there are opportunities for, for elaborating on potential solutions. So in that regard, um, I think we've helped our customers a lot by giving them those solutions in this, in this situation. And, and it could be, it, it, it's, it's a whole host of ways we look at it. It could be a, from, the, from the manufacturing point of view, from an OEM point of view, it could be a very intended, intentional <clears throat> type push mm -hmm. to get to increase their ability to focus on a core competency. Yeah, so I have that. customers that have fully eliminated processing internally. And a lot of our, I'm sure a lot of our competitors have done that too. And, or it could be to your point, Nick, it could be a very situational uh, effect, right? Where something is not coming in, there's delays. We saw, mm -hmm. we've seen that all a good chunk of 2021. So our team and what Jeff and our team, what we do is we have to help our customers flex that capacity. And we're able to do that through, uh, either internal, the movement of internal processing on our assets or through external assets. It's all about what I call the connecting the touch points. We got to connect all those touch points to find that solution. 
Yeah, and you know, you think about the things that that happened over the years. There, there was a time when when our customers were were trying to to you know get the, the best dollar that they could, or the, the cheapest cost option available, um, and that that came through um, a lot of international options, and it was really hard for the United States to compete in that regard, uh, and it still is today. Uh, but the landscape has changed to that, you know, if you're looking at it as can I get it for a, a good price to can I get it at all for that matter. Sure. And, and now that's the landscape we're in currently. Uh, and that's what I was alluding to earlier. You may need to look at things. Um, and anecdotally, again, these are just our opinions on, on what we've seen and try to help our customers. But, you know, trying to find other ways to get things done when we hit those hurdles or run into those roadblocks. Yeah, no, I think it makes a ton of sense. And, and it, it kind of ties back to what I was talking about earlier with regards to magnesium and aluminum. You know, in some of these markets, sometimes it's not even a function of being able to get it at a more expensive price. And in some markets, there are real risks where you just can't get it from a certain region of the world. Um, so I guess, do, do we have the ability to utilize our own equipment, our own assets to take something that might be more of a commoditized good and 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 turn it into a value-added solution for our customers. I guess can yeah, you give I, an example of something like that. Yeah, I would say I would say I would say definitely. Uh, um, you know, from a manufacturing point of view, I would classify like laser processing, for example, as a core competency at a lot of our customers. Um, and if there is indeed a issue with inbound from wherever that product may be coming from, you know, we could obviously take advantage of our supply chains and our equipment. And we do have examples where customers have made very conscientious decisions to outsource large volumes of work just to free up that capacity. Um, you know, what's interesting, a couple things. Um, my, my perspective, flat laser capacities and backlogs, at least in certain regions of the country, seem to be one of the big bottlenecks. And, 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 and that could be tied to more manufacturers outsourcing product to the distributor fabricators. It could be a, it could be a labor scenario. Um, but I'm, I don't know, Jeff, if you're seeing that, but the, the flat laser capacity in the marketplace is pretty interesting. It's, they're pretty busy. Yeah, it's, it's very saturated in that regard. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, um, you, you know, I'll give you an example on the material side um, in using our internal resources. This is just an example here, but you know, uh, with, with lead times extending, uh, you know, almost out to mid-year next year on some product lines, we'll give you an example of, of tubing. Um, you know, we had a specific customer come to us looking for a solution on a tube they couldn't get. Uh, unfortunately, it was a, it was a really heavy wall um, and, it, and it wasn't available in the marketplace uh, at, any, at, any, at any turn you took. The mills being out as far as they were, we decided to go a different route. Um, we took our own internal resources and, and made a bar into a tube. You know, at, at the end of the day, uh, it, it does the same thing and it met the mechanical properties of what we were looking for, but we didn't shut them down. We found a way to get them what they were they were looking for, but it, it came at a at a different avenue. It came at a different uh, different price point. It came at a different lead time, and that was the critical piece. The lead time was the best part, so we we helped them out. Okay, I, I hear Jeff. You, you, okay, you're turning a bar into a tube. Now that's definitely a creative solution. And when you look at the title of the slide, planning for 2022, I've written down things you've said. Lead times extended out to mid-year. Cannot get material. I mean, how can you plan for 2022? Is it just that? Is it is it trying to find creative solutions for um, these things that you just simply can't predict? Is that is that fair? It's more recognizing the opportunity for alternative solutions, right? We talked we talked about some substitutions here, knowing what can and can't be um, instead of taking it for what it is. Like this is how we do things. This is the way we've always done it, and this is what we always buy. Considering those alternative options, um, even though they may come at a different point, right? Whether that's a lead time or a price, um, knowing what those options are are available to you, uh, and what the associated lead times those may change, but. Uh, what those associated uh, benefits would come with. I think that's the biggest piece when you look at the planning portion is just understanding what's available to you. And not a lot of people understand what's available to them. Is that, was that would you agree with that, Mike? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And you, Mike, you said, so how do you plan? And well, part of it is just being engaged with your customer, right? Um, and, and making sure you understand their pinch points and not 
just a temporary pinch point, but a potentially a sustainable, you know, ongoing pinch point. And that's kind of what the Ryerson Advanced Processing does. You know, it's it's an ongoing effort to help solve whatever that internal bottleneck might be. And I, one more example, and you see it up on the slide there when we talk about processing equipment. Um, one of the kind of the innovative uh, technologies that's come out of the last five to eight years are, is the tube laser technology, for example. And that's kind of, it, it's, it's, it's reformatted the kind of the manufacturing footprint at a lot of customers relative to how they make a product. So Jeff was just talking about that conversion of the bar, right? So in the past, uh, if you had a tubing application, it would it'd be a multi-step process. So you take your tube, you take it to your saw, you take it to your machining center, and then you either put it in finished product or it goes to weld or whatever. So the tube laser technology has been around for X number of years now, but it's a fairly new technology that's really exploded. So to Jeff's point, a lot of our customers have taken advantage of that, but a lot still don't know how to take advantage of that. So that's what we do. But what's really interesting is uh, it's quick, it's grown so fast that it, it, in, in and of itself, it's become a bottleneck because it's become so popular. Engineers are redesigning parts for two blazer applications because it's a more cost-effective supply chain. That's a great point, Mike. So I, I, I kind of wanted to, and I don't, make, I don't mean to make this too much of a commercial, but um, if I'm hearing you right, it sounds like in a world that's awash with shortages, bottlenecks, kinks in the system, Ryerson has a team that's open for business where customers can export some of their processes to us. That's a, that's a really good summary. That is a good commercial, actually. So we're okay, trying yeah. not to make it that, but that's, <laughs> that is what we do, right? And um, it, it, I think... I think it depends on the specific application and the customer, but most of the customers, Jeff, I don't know if you'll agree, but they're very receptive, right? Anything we can do you know, within our industry to help our customer base is well-received. Um, they do not want to pay a lot more for the product, obviously, but they need to get the product out the door in a lot of cases. So that's where those solutions would come into play. So yeah, Ryerson Advanced Processing has the full complement of internal assets um, that are really driven by our customer base. So that, that's my commercial. Yeah, no, I, I think the timing is great. And I think it, it makes sense why you were, why you were voted in the poll to be the, uh, the entrance into <laughs> because, because I, th I think customers are, I hate to use the word desperate, but I think there's, there is an element of desperation out within the manufacturing environment right now. And anywhere there's excess capacity, I think, I think every level of the supply chain will seek that out. So um, really appreciate you guys joining. And, I, and I'm hopefully, I'm, I'm hopeful that at the end of this presentation here in just, you know, five or 10 minutes that uh, there'll be further questions for you guys. Great. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. So with that being said, we're going to finish up on the carbon side. We've got plenty to talk about on this side of things as well. I think it's a little different than what we've been, what we've been seeing and talking about within the base metals market. Um, specifically, what I mean by that is the general price trajectory uh, looks, looks a whole lot different, I would say, than, than many of the other markets that we, that we deal in. We've looked at this chart in the past. This is looking at U.S. hot roll prices relative to European hot roll prices and then Chinese prices in the orange. You can see that pretty much on a global basis, all of, all of these markets are rolling over a little bit. We talked about China fairly at length, but, but there are some things happening within the Chinese sector that are, that are a bit squishy. Um, I mentioned the property sector. I think there are some real issues where like Chinese property sales, they just reported a couple of days ago, property sales are down by 30% year over year. That's three zero. That's a big number. So on the back of that, we did see some weakness in steel prices, both on the hot roll side, as well as in rebar. Um, iron ore prices have, have suffered quite a bit. So there is a general softening going on within, within the carbon landscape. Um, talking about 232 and kind of applying it to this chart, as we look at European prices, which are currently sitting right around a thousand bucks, what does that mean? Well, all of a sudden it means that starting in 2022, 3.3 million tons of that product can now come to America without a tariff. So in my opinion, what that does is it just 
ever so slightly drops the floor to how far U.S. prices could potentially go. It's, it's not massive. And again, it's only on a finite number of tons, which represents 2 to 3% of U.S. supply or consumption. Um, but it, it's something that we at least have to discuss, that we might actually see a little bit further convergence in these spreads between the global markets. When we look at futures markets, I, I think this is pretty fascinating because I, what I've pulled in here is today's prices, which is going to be shown in orange. It's kind of hard to see, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, a week ago, which would have been basically prior to 232 being rescinded on Europe, we've got a month ago in the blue line. And then interestingly enough, you know, I hadn't pulled this up in a while, but I pulled up the six month ago price. And what I found fascinating about it was the fact that despite the fact that it was six months ago, and despite that six, six months ago, we were seeing carbon prices right around 1500 bucks, let's call it. We obviously saw steel prices go up substantially from there, another 400, $450. But what's interesting is when you look at the, the shape of the futures curve, even six months ago versus now, there really hasn't been that much deviation in the futures price expectation. I think that's kind of fascinating that the back end of these futures markets really hasn't budged on this notion that, that we should see things come back down. That, that's the current expectation. And that was generally the expectation six months ago. Um, obviously, the front end of the curve is where everything changed. We, we saw another $400 to $500 higher uh, prices over that six-month time period. But it very much so looks that the, the market is in general sync. And you can see that by looking at today's prices versus a week ago or a month ago that whether 232 is rescinded or not, the shape of the futures market is really much, really pretty much un unabated. Um, and what I think that means ultimately is that a lot of this bearishness or a lot of this price trajectory was really already built in. So when the 232 news hit, hit, hit all the headlines, I think some in the market thought that it was going to just crash the price relative to where the futures were. But in all, all reality, futures were already kind of kind of pricing in essentially the CRU coming down by 20 or 30 bucks every single week. Um, so fairly interesting stuff. And, and perhaps there are going to be some questions about that at the end. But um, nonetheless, it's interesting to see that really, whether we look at it relative to a week ago, a month ago, or six months ago, the back end of these markets really hasn't changed all that much. If anything, perhaps looking at the green line and the orange line, which would be a week ago and today, if anything's changed, it's ever so slightly dropped the floor, the, the, the potential expected floor as per uh, futures markets. Looking at the raw material sector, this is looking at iron ore prices. I mentioned iron ore as it relates to the property sector in China. Iron ore is most predominantly consumed within the Chinese steelmaking process. So it's kind of one of those things where, where China goes, so too goes iron ore prices. And you can see that over the last four or five months, we've seen about $120 per metric ton come out of the price of iron ore. So it's, it's certainly gotten cheaper to make steel over in China. We're not yet seeing that feed through to substantially lower prices in China, but, um, but that is certainly a risk. Looking more on the North American side of things, we've got the bushling scrap price here. And you can see it's, it's really, for the better part of the year, mostly hovered right around 600 bucks. Now, $600 is obviously a heck of a lot lower than where, um, where current steel prices are. So there's still a massive glaring gap between where bushling scrap is and finished steel pricing is. But it has been pretty resilient over the course of the year. You know, whether we've seen softness in steel prices or whether we've seen bullishness, scrap has been pretty steady right around 600 to 650 bucks. And I think a lot of that is really kind of centered around this idea that a lot more EAF production is coming online, not just within North America, but in Europe and in Asia. And that's, that's ultimately putting a little bit of a, a consistent bid into the price of scrap. And then lastly, I wanted to bring this up because I, I was listening to a, an earnings, earnings call with uh, uh, the CEO of Steel Dynamics. And, and he, was, he was talking about the automotive sector, how it related to the price of steel and how it related to the overall cycle of this current kind of business cycle or steel cycle that we're, that we're in. And one of the things he mentioned, and I, I tend to agree with it, is you know as we look here at automotive, uh, this is the automotive seasonal 
uh, seasonalized uh, production. So this is basically an annualized number. It's updated on a monthly basis. You can see that in the last couple months, it's gotten pretty darn weak. So we, we very much so are still in the thick of the semiconductor issues and the parts issues creating uh, supply chain hurdles for the auto industry. It's very much, you know, we've reported on it for many, many months now. Every, every headline on TV seems to be talking about it. But, you know, so on one hand, it's kind of, it's kind of bearish or it sounds kind of bearish. What, what the CEO of Steel Dynamics said was, in a way, this may actually help the glide path or the general trajectory of where we see steel markets going over the next 6, 12, 18 months, whereby there could be a little bit of, if we see the automotive industry see a little bit of life next year, maybe the semiconductor issues sort themselves out, they start getting parts in a little higher quantity, all of a sudden, these automotive companies might flip the spigot on and kind of provide that, that support for the steel industry that maybe it doesn't lift steel prices, but it may slow the bleed on where, where steel prices ultimately go. So the, the phrase that, that uh, Mark Millett actually said was, the bearishness that we're seeing in some of these supply chain bottlenecks may actually help to extend the duration of the business cycle that we're currently in, which I think is a fascinating way to take it as, as we look forward to uh, what 2022 may bring. Um, and with that, I am going to uh, kick it back over to Mike and uh, hopefully open up for some questions. Thank you, Nick, Mike, Jeff. Thank you for, for that. We have a few questions coming in from the audience. Uh, I'm gonna start off with one that um, Nick, to that last slide you spoke to. With automotive, are we seeing, because of the semiconductor issue, are automotive companies um, putting more steel tons back in the market or dumping them because of the chip issues? Still, uh, totally honestly, I have still not heard anything with regards to the steel industry putting tons back. Uh, within, within the European market, we have heard that rumor. Um, within the U.S. automotive market, we, we, I have not heard that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if any of my, any of our product managers would agree with that, but I have not heard any, any uh, instances of that. And, and we've talked about why for those who are new to the, uh, the cup of Joe, I think one of the big driving factors is, well, I think there are two. One is there's a belief that there's, there's backlog demand, which implies that they're going to need to steal at some point. So they're, they're going to produce whatever parts of the cars they can uh, when, when those pieces become available. I think the other factor of it is, and we've touched on this in the past, which is the steel contracts that they've struck this time last year for steel consumption are at massively, massively advantageous prices. So it makes sense that they would take every single ton that's under those contracts, um, even if they're not currently put it into a finished vehicle just yet. Sounds good. So Jeff, Mike, got a few, uh, few questions here for you. We ready for... Uh... First one, how has a logistic lag and trucking affected transit time for value added products specifically? So the question is with all, with obviously freight rates are high and um, some lag in logistics, how does that impact value added products and services? Jeff, you know, I'll, let you, I'll let you run with that, Jeff. That is a great question. I mean, I, I think it, uh, it's, a, it's a facet of the, the manufacturing process that's often overlooked. Uh, you know, one that says, okay, I got, I've got everything that I needed to done. I got the right people in the place in place. Finally, the right process is completed. I need to get it out the door now. And that's the last thing you want to be dealing with is, is not being able to find a truck or, or even at an effective rate for that matter. Um, it has played a role. Um, and again, the, the, the key note here that we were trying to get across is for, is planning for that purpose. Um, but it has affected it right. Uh, with the limited availability of trucks throughout the year, although it's gotten better, uh, it, it still has an effect. Um, uh, an example, a recent example, uh, even for those that are planning, um, it just might not be available at that specific time. So having multiple options is, is something that we've had to look at uh, to help with that. What would you say, Mike? I, I, yeah, I would also say that uh, I think that product is actually, value-added fab product is actually able to travel a little further too. So when you're building that robust supply chain to support your customer taking into account logistics. It really just depends on where it's coming from and uh, your product may travel for further if you have the right assets in place to support that customer. Yeah, the other yeah, thing I would right say value. is right, right, right value proposition, right? 
The other thing would be, do you have your own fleet of trucks, right? <laughs> so if you have your own fleet of trucks, you semi control your own destiny. You can do backhauls, for example. But, and Nick, you probably have the, the statistics. Still, there's just obviously um, a significant amount of tonnage that goes either LTL or contract common, you know, contract carrier. So yeah, there's no doubt it's been an issue. I would imagine then getting it processed closer to your location helps in that regard too. Well, it's, you know, it's very, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jack. to say that, that it, it, it's obvious in that regard, if you've got, you know, something that's sitting, you know, very close to you, it's going to be much easier to get. Um, mm -hmm. And what Mike was referring to is that value that you're putting to the product. It may, it may travel further distances, but you, you may still have that, that same issue, you know, where you want to rely on right now is hopefully a strong logistics supply chain or, um, you know, leveraging others that, that are experts in that field. Okay. Yep. The next one we got uh, relates to lead times. And we talked about lead times a lot when it comes to um, the materials, but this one in, in particular, when it comes to uh, fabrication and processing, um, it, do uh, do lead times in terms of like um, availability on the machine, capacity on the machine, do those come into play? Mike, you take this one. Yeah, I'll kick it off, Jeff, and you can jump in. So, Mr. Carraza, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, it depends on it, if it's if it's transactional versus a program or repetitive piece of business where we can plan for it. But we obviously have a lot of both. Um, but that's when, at the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about the ability to flex capacity, Mike. Right. So, if you're if you if you have a particular plasma unit or oxy unit that is backed up in a certain geography, you do have the ability to go elsewhere and and look at that that available capacity. Um, so yeah, so I I would say it varies whether it's transactional or program, but you try to fit what that customer needs. Sure. Absolutely. I'll, I'll add to that too, because this is just, these are again, my, my thoughts on this. Um, it, we, we've still got a shortage of a lot of things right now, people being one of them. And that is having an effect on, on how, how good those lead times are. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of success across, um, you know, even competition customers there, they are getting those resources back at a much slower rate, but they are coming back. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously not at as fast of a rate as we'd like, because we all want it all right now. I mean, you think of that, that song is stuck in your head. I want it all, but you, we, right now we can't have it all right now. So we're doing our best to work through what we, what we can have, um, even though those aspirations are kind of high. I do see lead times to, to give you a somewhat of a black and white answer. I do see lead times creeping back in, uh, and that's a recent, a recent development. Makes sense. Okay. We have a question also here that kind of goes back to the age old um, buy versus build, right? Um, in, in, in regards to processing, you know, when when is, um, for lack of a better term, the tipping point when you say, yeah, it's better for me to outsource this than for me to do it in-house. Are there, are there certain factors that you advise companies to, to look at? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, it's my favorite conversation. It's my favorite <laughs> value added conversation because it, therein lies the, the the question, what do you want to be when you grow up, right? Yeah. Relative yeah. to manufacturing and the process. And uh, ultimately, it's can we jointly put together, collaboratively put together a program that increases your throughput? And maybe that means we are offering more value add or the industry, fabrication industry as a whole is a great conversation, right? And mm -hmm. you just got to dig into the details, Mike, with your customers on that. Jeff, you want to add to that? Absolutely. Uh, it was on one of the bullets we had. It was talking about core competencies. And I know it's probably anecdotal, but when you when you think about what do you want to be when you grow up, I think Nick, you said that. Um, what do you want to focus your efforts on, right? In that instance, if your business is welding or if your business is, is something different or related to that, and, and you can do these other things, but you don't necessarily want to use the, the limited resources you have to do those other things, that's where the partnership and the collaboration actually comes into play. We're going to allow not just us, the, the right mindset is to, to focus on what you should be doing that's bringing your company the most value. And that's kind of the way I look at it. Yep. This question came in anonymously. So maybe uh, maybe Mike Nauman, you actually sent it in since it is your, your favorite question. Maybe you stuck it in. <laughs> but it, I think it's a good, not, good discussion. <laughs> um, Nick. Um, back to the uh, 232 slides. Now, 
you had mentioned um, TRQ on uh, when it's steel 3.3 million tons. Um, just to put that number in perspective, um, folks are asking how much is 3.3 um, versus total U.S. consumption? Is that a, is that a relatively large number? Small? What yeah, sure. I, I would say current estimates for like apparent consumption in the United States for for all steel products is roughly I'd say it's 120 ish million tons. Um, so 3.3 is is just under three. It's right around three percent. I would say. Okay. Okay. So. And then um, one of the uh, another question relates to um, HRC plate price. Um, do we know where that's at, um, and do we have any idea of when those prices might revert? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, generally speaking, and this is kind of just like a, a soft rule of thumb, we typically tend to see a relationship between hot roll coil prices and hot roll plate prices um, lagging to the tune of about two months. So. No, it's not necessary. I know. I know. My legal team is going to be holding a gun to my head when I answer this question. Um, but normally, the relationship would suggest that if we started to see hot roll coil prices turn over, you know, a month ago or a couple of weeks ago, um, we we may be seeing we we could potentially see something in the plate market come around year end. Would if if that relationship were to hold. Um, we've got some pretty interesting markets. So I, I do think while we're on the topic, it is worth noting that cold rolled prices and hot dip galvanized prices have actually been pretty darn resilient and actually gone higher to the extent that, I mean, cold roll prices relative to hot roll now, which historically that's got a long-term conversion spread of right around, let's call it 120 bucks. Uh, that's currently sitting at 340, I think it's $345. So the, the some of these spread relationships and some of these la lead lag relationships um, they've kind of fallen apart right now. So I guess I'll give that as my caveat to the plate lagging hot roll answer. Hey, but hey Nick, Nick, kind of Nick, what do you think about um, Nucor's bringing on that capacity in Kentucky and the impact that's going to have to the, you know, the available plate tons? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've done any modeling on, you probably haven't done any specific modeling on that, but uh, it's going to yeah. be interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is going to add more supply. Um, and, and you know, Nucor is not alone in, in being, you know, adding supply in the North American market. And obviously, you know, we've known that a lot of this supply was going to be coming to the market for the last several years. And yet we still just saw steel prices rise by 400%. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been the basis. A lot of these mills coming online has been the basis for some analysts uh, call for steel Mageddon. But uh, but I, you know I, I don't I don't think we quite land in that in that world. Um, but I do think that the the domestic market is going to be much better supplied in the coming for carbon products. You know, I'd like to go back and add one more one more comment on the <clears throat> on one hot roll coil and plate price reverting. Uh, you know that spread historically, I mean, it, it has kind of fluctuated back and forth between those two specific products. And I've been around on, uh, long enough to know that. You know, reliability says, you know, coil might be a little higher, but I have seen multiple instances over, over my duration here where, you know, big wide plate mill plate gets, you know, more expensive. And then I've seen it less expensive, like we're, we're currently at in this situation. So that fluctuation, that bandwidth, they add even more instability there. You know, who knows uh, in that instance is where, where, where that direction will take us. Is it going to be plate mill plate and customers revert that supply chain towards larger plate and larger processing? Or you know you flip the other side of the coin when it comes cost advantage, did you have those smaller sheets and plate sizes engineered into your product? So just some food for thought on that. It hasn't been consistent over the years. Yeah. That's, um, another question here from the audience. Um, any insight into the um, is it pronounced middle tube mill strike and the effect on supply? Anybody know about about that? Middle tube. Uh, I assume I assume it'd be maybe Arcelor Middle's tube. Arcelor Middle. Yep. Yep, um, I, I don't specifically on that one. Uh, I, I will say kind of more from a high level. And again, this is, I, I got to be a little careful about how I say it, but I personally think, you know, in, ter in terms of whether or not inflation is temporary or transitory, um, I sort of think we're heading into this, this world whereby employees have a whole lot more power and they're going to flex that power. I think I've talked about that in prior prior webcasts, but you know, we're seeing it at John Deere just in the last couple of weeks, we saw 
mm-hmm. you know, a United Auto Workers strike at their facility. And then they thought they came to an agreement. And then yesterday, the, you know, the union workers came back and said, no, it's not enough. We need better terms. I think that's going to be a microcosm of what we see across, not just, you know, at, at the consumer side. I think it's going to happen at mills, it might happen at service centers. Um, but I think it's going to be a, it's going to be fairly widespread phenomenon whereby, you know, a lot of people need stuff right now. And the people who deliver that stuff are, you know, blue collar type workers who maybe haven't felt all that rewarded over the last several years. And I think there, I think there's a little bit of a shift in, in wages and the, and the strength that those workers have within the global economy. And I think they'll probably flex it. So that's a very high level answer to the ArcelorMittal specific issue. But I, I don't think that this is going to be a, a siloed event. I think we're probably going to see a lot of, a lot of uh, strikes and things like that in the coming okay. Well, we're running up here against the hour um, before I turn it over for final thoughts um, to, to everyone on the panel. Just a reminder, the full um, episode will be available on, on um, our Ryerson YouTube channel um, tomorrow. Um, and then some follow-up on the gauge. Um, and then, of course, we do this the first Thursday of every month. And um, I do want my closing thought to be that um, this has been a very intimidating panel for me to be on with uh, so much hair on this panel. Um, <laughs> it'd be nice for me to get off. But I kick it over to the group here for some closing, closing thoughts. <clears throat> Mike, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say thank you. Uh, you know, uh, to, to us, uh, the way I look at it is it's all about, you know, being creative relative to supply chains in this environment, right? I thought 2020 was the craziest year ever, and then 2021 came, and now I'm really interested in 2022. <laughs> I am, I, it's going to be super interesting to see how we come out of the gates in 2022, but we'll be ready to uh, assist our customers for sure. Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity to offer any insight that we we could today. We're trying not to make it an advertisement. We're just doing our best to try to help uh, those out there that are listening to make sure that uh, they get their goals accomplished, like they're able to manufacture what they need to and get what they need to in a timely manner. So I hope maybe we offered some insight and maybe uh, some simple thought to, to, you know, being flexible and planning a little more as best you can. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I'm with you, Mike. I mean, if we continue on this trajectory, uh, I think 2023 might be the year the aliens come down and visit us. <laughs> it's we're, we're crazy. Right yep. But uh, no, I, I think, you know, we, we touched on the energy issues. I think that's going to be something we absolutely want to keep an eye on both within Ryerson and, and for all of our customers, because this winter, if it's, if it's chilly, we could, I, I, I guess I would encourage all of our customers to make sure you're having conversations to make sure you've got your energy contracts uh, locked up tight. Because uh, because things things could get interesting this this winter if we get cold and and what the, what I think that's going to bring with it is a lot of volatility in both directions for metals prices um, and then the last little bit I'll leave again it's quick commercial but Ryerson Advanced Processing open for business they've got capacity talk to your salespeople and uh, and hopefully you can export some of your your needs our way and uh, thank for everybody for your time and happy holidays as we head into holiday season. Yeah, right. Exactly. Thank you, guys. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.